Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead oh, wow. and get started. We have a very, very full day today if you've looked at the uh, jam-packed agenda. Uh, but I want to start by uh, welcoming Chairwoman Durham to uh, the podium uh, to welcome you today. But I'm just going to read a few things about her just so you can get to know her um, because she was just appointed by President Biden in October as alternate federal co-chairwoman of the Delta Regional Authority. And she's certainly uh, no stranger to DRA. I think those of you who either uh, saw her in DLI, uh, went through the Leadership Institute with her, or um, perhaps knew her from Louisiana, you know that she has been around DRA from the beginning. Uh, she was born and raised in Tensaw Parish, Louisiana, and attended the University of Louisiana at Monroe, the Warhawks. And since January 2016, uh, has served as Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards' DRA designee, to which she has just handed off um, that uh, designation to Roger Scott uh, this week. She previously worked for Governor Kathleen uh, Governor Blanco as Director of Renewal Communities and Delta Regional Authority designee, during which she was named the 2007 Louisiana Planning and Development District's Person of the Year. Durham is a Delta graduate of DRA's Delta Leadership Institute Executive Academy, and the only one, uh, both in its inaugural year of 2006 and again in 2017, in which she also completed the Authentic Leadership Executive Education Program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. On July, uh, in July 2021, the Louisiana Municipal Association awarded her with the LMA's President's Award for her years of commitment to Louisiana local governments. That's it for me. I want you to hear from her, so I want to welcome Chairwoman Durham to the podium today. Good morning. with us today. 
Today's instruction will help you finish your project strong and to expand and improve them, through, you know, to move forward. And not to put a too fine a point on it, but the success of this program literally rests on your shoulders. <laughs> so if you aren't successful, we aren't successful. So that's where we're going. You know, we've got to make sure we want to give you the tools that you need to finish really strong so we look good. <laughs> Three years ago, the Delta Regional Authority partnered with the Appalachian Region Commission and the U.S. Department of Labor, um, their training and administration, to award the first round of work opportunity and rural, for rural community initiatives. This funding opportunity was the first to support industry-driven workforce training and education specifically for rural communities. Delta Regional Authority developed a Delta Workforce Grant Program to complement the work program. Together, over 46.7 million has been invested in the Delta Regional Authority's footprint. Let me say that one more time. Three years, 46.7 million in the footprint. This is going to help build sustainable workforce pipelines and strengthen economic competitiveness within our community. This is a great start. And with your hard work and commitment to these workforce programs, we will continue to build the region's workforce, support rural revitalization, and strengthen the economic out outlook throughout our Delta region. I'm joined here today by some of the Delta Regional Authority's talented staff who will be here from from who you will hear from to guide you and instruct you throughout the day. At this time, I would like to hand the mic back off to Alex Holland, who you all know, and she has been very instrumental in successfully creating and implementing the Delta Workforce Program. So thank you, Alex, for all your hard work that you do on behalf of the Delta Regional Authority, and thanks to you all for joining us today. We're going to start early with our first session, but I do have some logistics that I do want to run through. Everyone loves a good logistics session here. You've got a lot of materials in front of you, um, and I would be in trouble if I didn't mention several of them. You've got the, uh, this is, there's only one of these on each table, the Delta Broadband Mapping Project. If you're not familiar with that, you have cards in front of you, cards with QR codes. You found the only reason you could use a QR code and it's to hand out these cards. Uh, it's important that people take the speed test that we have on our website. If any of you are familiar with how broadband funding comes down from the federal level, uh, the FCC does not have accurate data. We're trying to help with that to show where people actually have internet and it's not just one house that has 25-3 uh, service in a census block track to say that it is served. We're trying to show that we're actually pretty unserved in our region and we need to fix that issue. So please, if you haven't already, when you get home, take a speed test, hand these cards out to people, share this on social media, get this out um, to as many people as possible. The better data we have, uh, the bigger argument we can make for federal funds to come to your communities. The next thing you have is the Delta Summit. We'll be back here in New Orleans, March 29th through the 31st. That QR code, again, we're finding a lot of easier QR codes today. Uh, that QR code will take you right to the registration link. If you have not registered, I ask that you please do so. Uh, we're probably going to have 300, 350 people there. We've got excellent speakers, uh, James Carble, We've got uh, General Henri and we've got Sarah Smarsh. If you don't know those people, look them up. Don't tell anybody you don't know them, but you should have heard at least one of those three names. Uh, hopefully. Um, here's some other fun things. You all likely have a mask. We're going to ask that you please wear those unless you are actively eating, drinking, or speaking. We're trying to have the safest event possible today, so please uh, be mindful of that. Um, bathrooms. Mandy, where are the bathrooms? The gentleman to the right on this hallway, and then the lady is in, on, in the corner opposite of the registration desk. I would have given you the wrong instructions there, so whatever she just said is probably accurate. Um, 
You kind of know who's here, hopefully. We've got uh, 2019 grantees from the Delta Workforce Grant Program. Raise your hand if you are some of those people. Awesome. We've got uh, 2020 Delta Workforce Grant Program. Great. We are announcing the 2021 grantees on Thursday, so you won't know if you're one of those yet, so don't raise your hand. Um, we also have uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021 Workforce Opportunity for Rural Communities grantees. Any of you here? Awesome. So we've got a lot of people that have been funded by either program or both programs. Um, get to know each other. There's a lot of funds out there uh, for you guys to benefit from, and we want you to learn from each other. Um, just a quick look at the agenda. It's in your workbooks that you have in front of you that's going to give you notes for um, who's here. Um, one thing I do want to mention too, uh, if you see a mistake in here, whether it's your organization or another, please let us know. We'll flag that for next time. Um, but the agenda is on page four. Uh, you'll see that we are in our opening remarks. Uh, right now, but today we are going to jump into a session with Allison Forbes from the Center for Regional Economic Competitiveness and a couple of folks in the audience. We're going to do a uh, who's who speed dating. We did this last time if you were here with us from the beginning. It was very helpful uh, from what we heard to get to know uh, other grantees in the room, so we're going to go through that exercise again. Um, we do have some networking breaks uh, trickle through. Of course, we'll provide uh, beverages and, and light snacks throughout the day. Um, then we're going to go into some grantee lightning talks, learn a little bit more about some of the projects uh, that some of these grantees have, and also some of the challenges that they may have experienced. Obviously, we've had a very trying time for the last two years. We want to know how you were able to uh, get through that or any barriers that you might still be experiencing. Over lunch, um, I think some of you are usually curious about some of the programs that DRA has to offer. We are going to give you the highlights. We are just going to run through. We want you guys to eat lunch, talk to each other for a bit. Uh, but we want to make sure we're giving you as much information as possible today on DRA programs. And perhaps the favorite of the afternoon, if you are a work grantee, uh, you've had a great time, I'm sure, with grant administration with Department of Labor. Um, we are going to have some representatives join us today virtually. Um, please be kind to them. Uh, they have also put in a ton of work uh, for this program, but we, it's just an open line for you to ask questions. If you have not received a work grant and you are interested in doing so, or you've tried in the past and have not been successful just yet, listening to some of those questions will be very helpful. Uh, just for grant administration, it can also be looking ahead uh, for new grants that will be coming down uh, the pipe. We're then going to load a bus, if you're uh, taking the bus with us, over to our field experience at Next Stop. And these folks have put together <coughs> an excellent, excellent program. So I ask that if you can join, please do so. Um, we also included happy hour to convince you to go. Um, that was not a mistake. So we're going to do that uh, for a couple of hours. And again, hear uh, from some of the practitioners who have been operating these programs, the employers that have benefited uh, from the program and also some participants. And uh, one of the things that they do very, very well is measuring their outcomes. So for performance measurement, if you're interested in that, this is a session you do not want to miss. That will wrap up our day. Um, and like I said, it is a very, very full day. So hang with us. Um, ultimately, our goal here today is to begin to build a community of practice. And I know some of you who came the first time uh, with us in person a couple years ago, I think started to build that network of colleagues across the region. We can learn from each other, whether we're from a small community, a large community, doesn't matter the state, uh, we're sharper together, we're able to share those lessons learned and best practices. So please do so with each other. The last thing I want to do is introduce DRA staff. So if you have a question, um, please speak to these people with the camera. We have Shauna Blair, she's the Director of Communications and Public Engagement. Uh, we've got Susan Edwards in the back. She's a program analyst, and so you may have uh, seen her emails come through. If your emails look pretty uh, coming from us, that's her. Uh, I do not do that. Uh, we also have Mandy in the back who uh, was stuck in the elevator, and she survived. So she's still here with us, thank God. Um, and then, of course, you, you met Chairwoman Durham. Uh, my name is Alex Holland, Senior Advisor here at DRA. Uh, we're here to help. So if you have any questions about any DRA programs, please uh, come speak to us.
Uh, so without further ado, I do want to uh, invite Allison Forbes up to the stage to go through her presentation, um, and it's going to be a good one. Thank you, everyone.
So those are um, healthcare we find in <coughs> urban areas, um, manufacturing we find distributed across the region, high tech infrastructure in, in pockets across the region, and many of the region's leading sectors um, offer potential for new jobs and better careers. So we want to make sure we looked at this career pathways perspective. Are there good entry level opportunities? Are there high rates of entry level and middle skill occupations that would require some post-secondary training? We found if you look at the agricultural sector, which is the best distributed across the region, um, and combine that with life and natural sciences, that so you have those career pathways, a mix of different jobs at different levels, as well as in the engineering and architecture cluster. When we looked at high-tech infrastructure, um, we had to include it because of how quickly it's growing across the country, but especially how quickly it's growing here in the Delta region, um, and how essential it is as an infrastructure piece um, to region-wide competitiveness. So demand and supply in the labor market. We wanted to look at the supply of talent as well, um, talent shortage nationwide um, and in the Delta region is an urgent issue for businesses. And it's been, uh, it's not a new issue, right? And it's, uh, you have to look at those root causes. So uh, those the kind of persistent issues so the, the situation is worsened by historical disparities between communities, between different populations. Um, black Delta residents are more than twice as likely to be living in poverty than white residents, and female Delta residents are more likely to earn less than the average male worker. So these are um, both challenges and opportunities to make sure we're utilizing and engaging everybody. Um, that could help to meet the demand for jobs and, and make our communities more resilient to the challenges that we're facing. So continue to think about labor supply, not just who's in the labor market, how are they doing now, but what are those uh, pathways, how are people getting to the labor market, what does the training system look like in terms of higher education, but also thinking about post-secondary and industry uh, recognized credentials. In demand um, jobs are segregated by gender. Um, industries are, are segregated depending on what uh, occupations you're looking at, and, and the training opportunities mimic what we see in, in the employment field as well. Um, so we see even uh, some limited use of apprenticeship programs, but growing, that's a really exciting area where the DRA is investing. Um, but a lot of these um, provide very little access to women or minority yeah. residents. Um, and there's, uh, I was talking to a colleague at the table this morning, thinking about, um, you know, do those opportunities need, do we need to be more uh, engaging of those populations that are not currently participating in those programs, such as in the trades? Or do we need to meet those people where they are um, in the healthcare field, for example, women in healthcare, and making sure that they have career pathways um, apprenticeships and other tools to get to better jobs. Uh, formal training efforts are heavily skewed towards degree programs. So if you look at all the overall mix of the education opportunities in the region, there are a lot of lower skilled workers that would benefit from uh, post-secondary training that get them to a middle skill career. Um, but overall, there's more degree programs being offered. Um, ideally, you want to get people to those degree programs, but they need stepping stones along the way. So that was our analysis of the, the training and education institutions in the region. Then we looked at uh, middle skill occupations, kind of the skill gap question, to see if there are some commonalities and gaps in terms of opportunities um, in training across the region. And these are areas where we saw a lot of openings. So we don't, we don't like to only look at growth, we want to look at those openings where people are retiring or moving to other jobs, um, the total openings. And then we like to look at the completion from the education system, as well as from the workforce uh, VOA-funded training system as well. Um, it's not a complete picture, but it's kind of the best data that we have at our fingertips to understand where the gaps are. So we find a lot of um, supervisory positions um, where there is limited formal training available. A lot of the training is on the job, it's in-house, and um, could, 
those positions be filled more productively um, with training that is more formal, that is connected to credentials, that is connected to the education system. And so in these areas, if we're not graduating enough workers to meet projected demands, and I'm sure you can think of many other areas where there are gaps. Um, this is just kind of some trends across the entire region, it doesn't necessarily speak to the local challenges um, and the, the frictions in the labor market at the local level that keep people from getting and filling jobs that are in demand. Um, so I have uh, just some more, more detail on employment by race and gender, breaking it down by male and female, and this will um, be in our report that is in process, and we complete it at the end of the year. Um, but this is a, just a little preview. So we can see the unemployment rates and the labor force participation rates um, by the different populations, and this is from the American Community Survey at this ACS. Just to give you a sense of the, the granularity of the, the data that we were able to include in the report, um, earnings by race and gender. So not just the unemployment rate, labor force participation rate, by earnings by race by gender. And this again comes from the American Community Survey. So here we're looking at some of those disparities between the, the male and the female populations. Um, we were able to explore the apprenticeship um, data, which is a, a rarely explored source of data, but um, it does help us give us insights into who's participating in apprenticeship programs. So um, welcome you to explore this on your own as you're looking at your own programs, looking at your statewide programs, how are they doing in including people um, from different demographics and engaging people in, in different communities current programs nationwide and in the Delta region um, in the trades employ no number of women and that's not necessarily the case in all programs. Some programs are successful in engaging women. Apprenticeship enrollment um, by race as well. So just more granular detail um, to encourage you to, to, to ask these questions of, of your own programs. Um, what information can we find um, that can help identify this better for our regions. Again, we're just doing a broad overview for a very diverse region. Um, so we covered some of these first two bullet points in terms of whether the training and education programs are meeting the, the demand of employers. And this third bullet point just emphasizes that a, a smaller share of, of workers are able to access degree programs um, low levels of education, of high school attainment, um, post-secondary completion means that those uh, community college programs and apprentice programs that you are all are investing in are incredibly valuable. Um, high, high number of health professions and programs, so an opportunity to make to see how those are working to use those as models and continue proofing them. And um, I know just in another note on apprenticeship programs, currently many are offered in construction industry and um, employ a few women. So obstacles, and we had deep, um, deep discussions with the stakeholder groups about these obstacles that you don't necessarily find in the data, you might explore for your own neighborhood, but what challenges are people facing? Um, the poverty rates, high poverty rates compared to the national average, and also lower educational attainment compared to the national average. And uh, these economic challenges are even more pronounced for people of color and for women. Um, so uh, on kind of <clears throat> some of the points we mentioned before, a few more here. Black Delta residents are more than twice as likely to be living in poverty than white residents, more likely to be unemployed, um, with higher unemployment rates, and receive lower pay when they are working. Female Delta residents are uh, more likely to earn less, typically uh, 9,000 less than the average male worker, and to receive uh, less public support um, when, on, when in unemployment. So continuing the stakeholder insights and the feedback from the stakeholder sessions we were able to convene um, talent shortages, just top of mind, urgent every day. 
um, biggest challenge across the region um, that employers are struggling to find the talent that they need. Then the key structural challenges, these sticky issues that are difficult to address in the near term. Um, so short term issues, fear of COVID-19, the need for childcare and sick relatives, we've all experienced this, um, but also structural, more persistent issues, lack of transportation, affordable housing, broadband, and childcare. Um, and I can't tell you how many times uh, we hear these four themes and how long we've heard these four themes and how much we need uh, the ingenuity and creativity in this room to identify some paths forward and some solutions to, to, to share with your colleagues here, but also across the country. Um, then we identified this, this big training gap in terms of frontline supervisors and managers. And this is so critical because those are the frontline supervisors and managers that are shaping the experience of frontline workers that are supporting those workers and identifying opportunities to make changes, um, even minor changes, in the workplace to keep everyone safe, to upgrade machinery, to update uh, training practices. Um, so, see an opportunity for partnership there. The, so, great insights from stakeholders and even more exciting insights from leading practices and promising programs that the DRA has funded. So, this was the most fun part of the report, hearing what's going on across the field, across the region, the investments in apprenticeship, the investments in work-based learning. Um, so we talked to some exemplary programs that we identified um, in collaboration with DRA and DRA stakeholders. And our key takeaways were the partnerships um, from these case studies that we did, which are included in the report, the local, regional, and federal level partnerships. So all of these leading programs that we ended up uh, getting to know and, and describing had some sort of community college partnership. Uh, had partnerships across various levels of government. And they were responding specifically to employers' needs. Employers were closely identifying those needs, um, directing the agenda. And so these programs were created um, in response to specific industry need, not just incorporating industry feedback, right, but responsive initially had their origin in those demands of industry private and public sector collaboration in program design, so not down the road, but at the start of the program, um, that these programs were available to new workers, available to incumbent workers as well. Um, interesting to see that in all of these programs. Um, and had some federal, had federal support, had funding support, so echoing comments earlier, absolutely critical to make sure all the partners can be at the table. Um, <clears throat> And, and so I'm super excited to be here today and learn more about these programs um, from the panelists and from the speed dating um, and throughout the day. Um, uh, just a couple other comp details. They embrace, these programs are embracing hands-on experimental program design and providing strong wraparound services to support program participants responding when they identify those needs. So hopefully you all are familiar with one or two programs like that. Um, we are, have some broad recommendations coming out of this report for both the, the data analysis, the case studies, the stakeholder engagement, um, and some recommendations <clears throat> that we want to preview with you all now. So key recommendations for the Delta region, thinking about this. Um, vast, diverse region. Uh, it stood out to us that increasing completion of high school and post-secondary credentials um, was an important emphasis that the stakeholders were already investing in these areas and we wanted to support that momentum, um, thinking about creative ways to do that with employers and people at work so we can complete those credentials while we're working. Providing more earn and learn opportunities for upskilling and along and demand career pathways. A 
again, thinking not only about K-12, post-secondary, but thinking about what we can do with employers while people are at work, um, including for your K-12 students who need to earn while they're learning, uh, your high school students, um, and have adult responsibilities. So um, a, a very uh, strong recommendation, and I think that a question that needs to be shaped by this audience today is, is how you champion diversity, equity, inclusion <clears throat> to address some of the disparities that we saw in the data. Um, <clears throat> but defining what it means for each of the Delta communities and for the DRA as a whole to have a, an equity agenda, um, defining, measuring, and reporting progress on that agenda, but definitely needs something that is built um, together. And then um, another outstanding observation or finding um, supporting resident-led quality of life initiatives that help to attract and retain talent. That was something everybody was interested in doing, how we do that for new arrivals to our communities. Oh, thank you. Mm. If I did one thing, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get to the recommendations. This is good. more exciting than the data part. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> so the um, resident-led quality of life initiatives not only help us with the uh, attraction and talent retention issues, but also with the community building initiatives that we need for economic development, workforce development to be successful, um, civic, civic leadership and civic participation that comes with that. And that you know, they address uh, housing issues, broadband issues, as well as physical infrastructure, um, amenities, and uh, recreation. So we also wanted to provide some additional recommendations. I share this preview of these these with you today, um, and get some kind of to get ideas at, for all the different stakeholders in the Delta region, for local development districts, for employers um, to have some action items, for higher education leaders, and for policymakers. Um, so for policymakers, starting from the bottom there, thinking about ensuring state load programs effectively serve Delta communities um, and support worker upskilling and industry modernization. Um, so both thinking about the worker perspective, the employer's perspective, and how we build more competitive and resilient economies. Um, and then I want to jump to the top for local development districts um, that have to weave all of these things together at the community level, identify those civic leaders, and engage them in these efforts, um, engaging employers and higher ed um, in those labor markets, commute zones, <laughs> and uh, local development districts. So identifying and filling gaps in pathways, um, making sure that we know what information we need, we know how to find the information that we need, people feel like they have access to that information to and make informed next steps. And um, for higher education leaders, is jumping down to the third group here, um, contributing to those earn and learn programs for working people and demonstrating and promoting best practices in the use of data. They have, uh, you know, education leaders um, should have access to a lot of information about students and how they are doing and making that partnership around data with the workforce system, with employers to find out how people are doing when they go to work are some critical connections um, that the higher ed system can, can help communities to make. Finally, for Delta employers, um, getting together with other business leaders to advance talent development solutions. What are employers willing to do together? What are their pain points? And who are their trusted training providers um, that they're willing to invest in um, and to make ensure that those are working for um, their workforce? So I know that's a lot for one morning, um, and we're gonna start to open the conversation 
Now to um, everyone in this room, starting with Allison and Kevin, um, to get some reaction to the presentation, some thoughts on your own experiences. And are we gonna um, share a microphone or do you think people will be able to hear if someone stands up at their table? Let's do the mic. Mm -hmm. I turn my feet left, so Chair, but I was kind of I don't know what I'm going to confuse. So I guess you don't go dogs because that's not. <laughs> uh, I'm Kevin O'Neill. I'm the vice president of regional workforce training and economic development at Western Kentucky Community and Technical College in Paducah, Kentucky. We were, were awarded a, a work grant in 2020. Unfortunately, COVID had its way of uh, postponing our training. Let's say. Um, all the way to October of 21, we couldn't do anything with our project because our project is a, it's called Project Phoenix. It's an, in, it's an inmate re-entry training program to skill up inmates that are gonna enter the, the citizens of the you know, community of the state of Kentucky and other places with skills to reduce recidivism and give them a skill that they can, can break the cycle, I guess, so to speak. So with our good friends of the Department of Corrections, they did not allow any training to go on. So I you know, was still doing a quarterly report that said, no activities this quarter. You know, and I just, you know, so finally we get to, we got to start in October of 21. But I can't tell you enough uh, how this thing has, uh, has evolved. Uh, before we wrote the grant, uh, the jailer there in the regional in Crackman County, uh, was really burdened about the inmates and just seeing the cycle of, of what they, he just sees them coming back. I mean, just, it was a revolving door. And, you know, looking deeper at the breakup of the, of the traditional family unit and looking at the, at the burden on the taxpayers and, you know, just, just goes on and on and on. So he began then through funds that he only had through concert there at the jail. Uh, a couple of instructors locally that uh, just gave up their time. Uh, at college, I had some funds that I was uh, more than happy to purchase materials and things with, because I believed enough in the program that I thought this was, this had some legs on it. So we actually did the first training uh, with a group. Uh, now the areas were deckhand, uh, basic electricity, uh, introduction to HVAC, and welding. And we ran a, a cohort, uh, and it was very successful. Recidivism was, was uh, dropped by 80%. It was, it was just phenomenal. So when this grant opportunity came about, we wrote it. So then we didn't have to say things like, we should expect, or we hope to find, because we had made it tested it basically. So we were, we were ready to go. And the local contractors uh, and uh, the uh, towing companies, because we're the largest inland river waterway uh, location uh, in the country, groundwater location. So we have a lot of towing companies, they need welders. So we knew what's, what, what skills and what uh, training they needed. So, um, so then, yeah, we, we started through that first one and then we launched and we've already finished our first welding class uh, of 12. They all got a certificate, first uh, certificate of welding. Uh, there's others, even in this group, that had, uh, had some welding experience and got as much as three, as many as three certificates. So they are itching to get out. I mean, they, and their whole attitude has changed. Uh, we offer and award them non-credential seeking 
workforce credit. So they actually received college credit, never expected even Dr. Lador, the college, they really didn't come through the college per se as far as our facilities, but they are receiving credit. And, I, and you just don't know what it does to self-esteem and just a sense of work. Uh, so we do include wraparound services for this. So once they're released, they are able to have, uh, if they don't have a place to live, there's halfway house and some facilities for them uh, so they can get on their feet. It's very interesting that uh, those that are that are released, most of them are not from the Paducah or Crampton County area, they're not choosing to go back home because they know if they go back to home where they were, they're gonna get back in maybe possibly the same environment and they're gonna, they're gonna just slip back. So uh, it's been a great, uh, it's been a great uh, rollout and we expect it to continue to be very strong without these funds. It's, it's just been a, been a game changer. And I can tell you that our state and federal representatives are very encouraged by it. Uh, they like updates, they're following this very closely. So that's, that's the 30,000 foot. And Kevin, any reactions to the report? Just from oh, what yes, you heard today? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that you, you're dead on with your, your information. The problem that we, that we uh, of course we have a captured group here with inmates, but uh, one thing we're not able to do at this point, we have reached those females. So that's a harder one, but unfortunately the females have, uh, there are these class D felons and some of the females are not class D, so we're working on that. So the women are <laughs> but yeah, I think your findings are correct. With us being a very rural area as well in Western Kentucky, we have a very depressed, uh, you know, income levels and economy right now. And what's on your mind for a, a learning agenda? Something you'd like to learn with others over the course of the the year? I uh, just uh, just right now I'm excited about ours. I'll be glad to share anything. I've got to get a binder over there about that thick, but uh, just see what practices what we can uh, what we can get from okay. I'm sure there is some things. Yeah great thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, let's have let's hear from Allison and then we can pass uh, the uh, metaphorical mic around the room. I think maybe we're not we're not passing for germs or something. Good morning I'm Allison Washington. I'm associate vice president of community outreach with the nonprofit Delta Health Alliance from the Mississippi Delta. And our workforce grants, we were 2020 awardees, and our grant targets healthcare and early childhood development. And I think that it was very important that those two were coupled together because we have so many women who are untrained and they don't have the opportunities for employment, and then they are also mothers. And so it's difficult for them to get into these skill training programs and be able to attend the classes and then move from those skills training programs into the workforce and they don't have the proper childcare. So with, um, in writing our grant, we couple those two because we want to make sure that we're getting individuals trained to not only be care providers for the children, but also have those parents or those moms to be able to get into the workforce and work and not be concerned about the well-being of their children. Um, with our program, we are in year two. We've had the opportunity to partner with two community colleges in the Mississippi Delta. And when we think about the Mississippi Delta geographically, there's this vast land space, um, and there are not a lot of training programs centrally located. So we work with a program out of Coma County that is about two hours over from our next training program. However, we're covering 22 counties over three states. And so it's a huge challenge to get individuals to the programs to cover all of the counties that we're representing or we're covering, and then including those states. Having said that, we have reached out uh, to a couple of universities across state lines to work with them. Some success, but COVID hit us because we, we entered into a partnership with Christian Brothers University out of Memphis, Tennessee, and we were just not able to get the work done. And we ended up having to dissolve that partnership. So, and, and primarily COVID was the cause of that because that position does having that partnership with Christian Brothers would have allowed us to reach the counties in Tennessee that we were 
are, uh, we are, are attempting to work with and also the counties in Arkansas because it was just more centrally located. So the challenges that we have seen on the ground is the space that we are covering and the program training opportunities that are available. With the schools that we are working with, we have seen great success. Uh, Mississippi Delta Community College in Moorhead, Mississippi has what's called a CAP Center. And it is really just a technical center is offering short-term programs in medicine, short-term programs with power, we have a linemen's program, and we have the HVAC, and we have in the carpentry, and all of those programs. But the challenge that we face with that is being able to recruit men. In our area, it's easier for us to recruit and, and maintain um, female participants who will actually stay the course of the program and then also receive all of the wraparound services that we are offering. With our program, once they enroll and they maintain their academic success, we also include career coaching for them, where we assist them in writing their resumes. We do interview prepping. We also even do um, financial literacy coaching with these individuals because poverty is such a, uh, a, a stigma and such a problem in our area and if we get them trained and we get them into the workforce, oftentimes they don't know how to manage their money. And so we have we coupled that financial literacy with it. Those are some of the challenges that we have seen that give us these opportunities for improvement to our work on the ground and give us the opportunity to make a greater impact in the Mississippi Delta area. I hope I have shared something that kind of piques your interest and I don't know if we get questions Yeah, let's open up um, the room to questions. I'm just curious your reaction to the report and anything that's on your mind for learning more about with your colleagues this year. So I think that this report was dead on. And one of the things that was, was that hit home for me was that in our area, we see so many young people who graduate from high school who really don't have workforce skills and they are not workforce ready. And so something that I would like to see and we work towards in our area is getting those programs into the schools or recruiting classes from high schools mm -hmm. who can actually be a part of the training programs. Uh, my colleague and I, we are working with a high school out of the Humphrey County area to get about 10 students enrolled because they're entering into their last semester of their senior year in high school. And so we're trying to get them enrolled into a pharmacy tech program to work dually while they finish the last semester of high school. So once they finish, they will have a skill set to enter into the health workforce and be able to come out of high school ready to go to work and to be an earner in our community. Mm. That's great, thank you. Yeah, I think I'll uh, take the mic around the room and see if I can project some questions or comments. Roll Tide, sorry I didn't say it first. <laughs> Thank you. It's gonna rain some days, baby. It has, it did, but we still know it too. We'll take it. <laughs> we will take it. Um, in regards to the programs that you got, you said that you guys offer the short-term programs. You said medicine, HVAC, and what was the third one? Um, we do, we have several programs in medicine. Okay. So we got our uh, short-term health, we have Yes. Okay, here we go. So with the short-term medical programs for the two community colleges that we work for, we offer training programs with um, EMT, Pharmacy Tech, um, CNA. We also have a program for EKG. And all of these programs are anywhere from 10 to 16 weeks. And so they can get their certification to work in those job opportunities. And it sets them with a, a base salary of anywhere from 34 to about $42,000, which is really good. Um, also, we have now 
because I work for a, a nonprofit that has multiple grants, we do have some grants that actually fund the HVAC, um, the carpentry, the lining, and the electrical. And that's through one of the community colleges that we're working for as well. With that, we just we don't want to put them out into the workforce and they are ill prepared to manage their money. And so while they're in their training, one of the conditions for receiving the financial support through this grant with our agency is that they have to attend a five-week financial literacy boot camp. And we have partnered with Matt Fact, with Planners Bank, and with Guarantee Bank. And so we have bankers that teach different aspects of financial literacy over the course of the five-week period. And once our students or our participants have completed, we use um, this company called Merit, and so they get merits for everything they do their training in. And we have, Merit has reached out to all of the potential employers in the areas that we cover, and they have access to see all the merits that the students have earned. So it's kind of like what Eric has said, they get to get these credentials, and it's available for those different employers to be able to see. Okay. I'd like to add something to that when you freshman this community college. I think it's incumbent on your community colleges, I know we are, uh, they are your source for short term uh, trainings that will get people with a certificate, the industry recognized certificate out there to, you know, to be able to scale up or be able to get that first job. And I know that we do, I think most community colleges do, I think more now than ever, that's a place for a lot of this to happen. Not a question, but just a suggestion or some things that we do in West Alabama. Um, one of the things, our, our largest partnership is our K-12 system. And we work very closely with the CTE programs in our area. So within those credentialing, for instance, that's where we start at the seventh, really we start probably in the third grade with the schools with just financial literacy, understanding the value of a dollar and then taking it as farther as going to our seventh and eighth graders with our Girls of Works event and giving them the opportunities to be in front of those industry leaders. Because we said it best, every child that graduates from high school does not have a plan. Everybody is not gonna to wanna to go to college. Everybody is not gonna be want to be a doctor or a teacher or either, or, um, either you know, they have some type of career. That's something that we see every day in our school system. So being able to meet those kids where they are is where we need to be and stop waiting on them to come to us, let us go to them. So it's it's perfect. It's just what you said exactly. So I completely Lisa, agree. Lisa Mike, what is one thing you'd like to learn with this community over the next year? So the one thing that we have that's, I think our largest dilemma in, in your grant, you talked about it, is the transportation aspect and the financial aspect. Um, some of the problems that we, that I see is that in rural areas, a lot of people that want to go to work can't go to work. Um, we have a lot of ride share opportunities with, you know, you have trains that ride together. Well, let's just say, we ride together and Kathy gets sick and Kathy's the driver and I don't know how to drive. Well, that's me and Kathy not at work today. So we're looking at different ways to figure out, you know, that transportation opportunity. And then another thing, if you look at a lot of the individuals that are working are staying are in subsidized housing. So it's it's to a point where okay, I'm making twelve dollars an hour, but once I hit twelve fifty the $13, that's gonna put me in jeopardy of losing my home, but I'm not making enough to pay a mortgage. So that's, these are the things that we kind of look at, try to figure out what's that gap. So like workforce housing, somewhere that's not necessarily, okay, you can only make this amount, but give them some type of coaching or something to help them get to that, that next level's living, I guess. Do I have a time, the time to address the transportation for? Sure. And it's, it's really not to address as a solution, but just to echo what you're saying, the area that we live in, that I live in, um, there's not very many opportunities for ride sharing aside from I'm riding with my friend. Right. Um, there are some grant funded transportation programs that are in our areas, but what we have found to be a challenge for us is that 
the individuals that we are serving, they are not aware of those programs that are available. And when they become aware of those programs, the steps that they have to go through to get the transportation is so cumbersome um, and computer-based a lot of times that they simply don't know how to do it. All right, we keep the mic moving. I hear from other people in the room, and what's something you know you're challenged by, and you're hoping to learn about this year? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Penny McGee, and I'm with the Gratis Project, and we're a nonprofit serving the Greater Memphis area, and we provide transitional employment to domestic violence survivors. And so we're partnered with our with Southwest Tennessee Community College to offer them. The certified production tech um, cert level one certification and we're preparing them by um, employing them in a gourmet popcorn business and so they work in the gourmet popcorn business as their transitional employment opportunity and then we're preparing them for food-based advanced manufacturing in the greater Memphis area so Kellogg for example is one of our uh, partners pretty on rice some of one of our employer partners and so, uh, first of all, in terms of the report and the data that stood out to me was that there's a small, you mentioned in, in one of the slides, there's a smaller number of people who are eligible um, for especially public support when they're receiving UI. And so we see that come to play, come into play. Um, so for example, we, um, you know, uh, for example, one of the personas or profiles of one of our clients, you got, um, she went through, she finished the certified production tech certification was able to pass the national exam, but she has four children, six, five, three, and two months old. So she's, she uh, did not have child care for the special needs child or the two month old. So she finished our program successfully, but because we're preparing individuals for food-based advanced manufacturing, which is ship work. So uh, primarily most of the individuals that go directly into employment with our employee partners end up on second shift. So then you, there's the issue with, you've got child, child care age children that you've got to support in an after school environment, and then you've got non-school age children that she has the dilemma of there's no child care slots. Um, she cannot start the child care certificate program until she starts her job. So, you know, it's, it's like this, you know, chicken and the egg constantly. Um, and so definitely looking for, uh, what are some of the ways and what are the, what's the, what's really some of the reason, what's the backdrop behind the decrease in public support for individuals on UI? Um, the other issue that we're seeing is the dilemma with housing. So several of our clients have evictions on their record because they had to quickly leave situations for safety reasons. So they were exiting an abusive situation left um, a lease situation and had evictions on the record. So we're trying to help them with the evictions, with child care. So our issue is not that they can't complete the program and that they can't get these national certifications, but there's these other shadow barriers that prevent them from working. So I'd love to hear more about how we can figure out how to influence policy as it relates to the public support so that individuals can be, can be employed with the new skills that they want. That something that's challenging you that you'd like to learn about with this group this year? Uh, any reactions to the report? Thank you. I'm Daisy Worrell with Rural Health Association of Tennessee, and my reaction to the report, first of all, thank you very much. I found it incredibly affirming that we are where we need to be and working um, with healthcare, and we've got a lot of talent in the communities. We've got a nursing shortage, and how do we bring um, solutions that can uh, get the, that talent to healthcare professions? One of my um, challenges in being new to the workforce space and our programming is a little bit more elementary. Um, uh, the communicating the opportunity and community, communicating a pathway um, for people who, both employers and potential apprentices, I think is challenging for us. Um, it's just, we don't have that infrastructure, so if there are any suggestions around that, how we can strengthen those communications to help them 
understand the possibilities and the pathway that is available to them would be really, really helpful for us. Great, that's an uh, interesting challenge, especially thinking about those pathways in rural areas, right? Um, some good pathway mapping that we've seen in um, places more urban that have more options for people, but that's a great challenge for the group. I see a hand. <laughs> Daryl Dixon with North Delta Planning Development District with Project Administration with Anala County and their work uh, grant. One of the things from the report that struck me, uh, one of the recommendations I believe is listed there saying more um, college educated. I'm wondering kind of where that line gets drawn because a lot of what we're seeing in terms of even driven for the uh, desire um, and the um, really the will for our program is folks who want to avoid the college track mm -hmm. and want to find especially those middle wage jobs and uh, do that without, especially without getting into debt and doing that. And so I wonder how that breaks down in terms or maybe a better way to communicate even that recommendation. And then two things that um, have become challenges for, or we've seen as challenges, and uh, we'd love to learn about uh, how others have uh, used it as an opportunity. Number one, on the housing piece, because of the rurality of our area, uh, like you mentioned in your report, there are folks who drive hours in terms of work uh, opportunities, and especially one of the things that our project did was to consolidate a lot of training that could happen in one place uh, it's adaptive reuse of a uh, outlet mall, so interstate frontage uh, right at the uh, intersection of two main highways. Uh, and so lots of, uh, especially um, people uh, finishing high school, want to go through the program and get some of those job opportunities that are closer into that city, but housing is an issue in terms of availability. It's just not there. Um, it's not connected to the training providers, the community colleges, main campus where there is more housing there. So they just need more housing in the area where now the training is going to go on. So it's really kind of an issue of the economy having to catch up and it's just being slow to do that if anybody's dealt with that issue. And then secondly, about the K-12 linkages, which you also um, talked about in the report. And I've already talked with Joseph uh, and some others who in their programs are linking in clubs and associations uh, that are active at the K-12 level. Our project does some of that as well through uh, an issue there. But one of the things that I have found, especially with those clubs and associations, is for especially K-12, if they can't see it, it's hard to get them interested in it. They may be in the club, but if they're not actually seeing the work going on, it still doesn't quite click, so they may finish K-12 and have been in the club and go do something completely different rather than moving on in that same path. And I guess another um, issue there is to some others that we're talking about, even the ride sharing issue is um, uh, it's, it's commonality. It's my friend is going into this, so I want to do this, especially in the K-12 type world, you know, we're friends and he's going into, he wants to do something in manufacturing, so I want to go and do that program as well. We just had our first uh, uh, crop of trainees uh, or cohort of trainees come through the program and one of the uh, participants who was in the diesel mechanic program died. And the interesting thing about that was not just that when he passed away, just losing that participant, was the number of people who decided they weren't going to continue. There were actually some students who didn't continue because he wouldn't continue. And so I wonder if others have dealt with that in terms of maybe ways to make those linkages start at K through 12 and keep them strong even through a training program like that. I'm gonna hand it right back to you. You mentioned a lot of things. What is the thing that you think you would be most willing to spend your time and energy on learning about with this group this year? The thing I'd be willing to spend most uh, most of the energy on is um, some of those uh, wraparound services, which I'm hearing a lot of folks talk about how they're attacking that, just because those do tend to be some of the bigger barriers. Um, and I think they're one of the, some of the things that we can do some more about. And, and you know, thankfully the program is here to offer some of those wraparound services. Some of the other things that I mentioned is just much harder to do. It's just going to be 
things like the economy catching up, other things like that. Th these are things that we can do uh, on housing, on transportation. So those are some of the things I'd be willing to spend more time on. Great, lots of important uh, ideas there. Um, and then just response to the question about college. Is college, is that something we're, you know, asking people to do? I think in, in our recommendations, we emphasize finishing high school and some sort of post-secondary training. And I think in my comment, I said doing that on, a, on the way to college or being able to complete college credits. And that's from my experience of studying youth and apprenticeship programs and their uh, parents needing to know that there is at least a path to college. So that's that's part of what that, that's coming from. <laughs> yeah, but making sure the parents are on board and that all options are open. We're not cutting off any options for anybody. Good morning. Hi, Jamie Horning, uh, Hershey University. Campus president there, and my question to the panelists are more about the pathways. You spoke in the report about the pathway with education and showing that pathway, whether it's a certificate, a degree, a diploma. And I wanted to ask both of you if you could speak to how the states or the other schools in the regions look at your training at the certificate level, and do they view that as an entry level way into a pathway? For example, does the certificate lead itself into an associate's degree, or does it lead itself into more? So it keeps that pathway of growing open for that individual. I can say for our system, it does, because the certification uh, that we're doing in welding is just a part of the first class in welding, so they can they could go on into matriculate into the, the welding degree program, and, and for that matter, really, the, the marine technology with the deckhand, and uh, the electricity and HVAC is the same. So we try to be sure that we do that so that they can, can have those, you know, that, that do fit into a program. Yes. With the two community colleges that we work with, the CNA program is a stepping stone to maybe LPN and then possibly the associate's degree in, as an RN. Um, but with the other programs, they don't necessarily lend to a stepping stone to a, a the next level. They would have to get those prerequisites and then start those programs. Thank you, great questions and ideas. A couple more thoughts, let's do two more and then um, wrap it up. Um, will you be brief? Yes. <laughs> My name is actually Ben, not brief. Um, uh, I come from a family of long talkers, so I think 45 minutes is about as brief as I can be. Uh, I'm, with, uh, I'm with Next Stop, we do better in military employment. First, I just, I'm very excited about all the innovation I'm hearing in the room. Uh, I'm here locally, and y'all are doing some great things in your different communities. Um, I think you talked about things we're interested in learning in, uh, about this year. I think the advertising of your programs, right? A few of you have different different uh, grant verticals that you're working with. Um, and we're, uh, you know, we have a very small particular population. That, we work with, but they're transient because they're leaving service, coming back to communities. So I just think I, I'd love to learn more about how, what your successes are and how you're leveraging social media or what have you, or, or community organizations or professional organizations to advertise your program and get participation. Break it up. Perfect. Thank you very much. And one more hand. I'm good. Oh, no, 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 please do. Please do. Yeah. 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 Are you statements? Hi, I'm Lou Ann with Southeastern Louisiana University, the RN CAP program for the grant, and then the second one is Louisiana Digital Health Institute, which I'm very excited and want to learn more about this program because I may make it an assignment for my doctorate students in healthcare informatics. So, um, in our RN CAP program, we do create a pathway. It's almost like for a second chance uh, because it's very competitive getting into the BS. RN program. And so um, what we're doing is offering an accelerated program with the community college. And so they go and they graduate as an LPN. They matriculate right back in our, into our program and join an accelerated program. So um, they may add a couple of semesters to the path, but you know our outcomes have been very positive. Now, where we're having a problem is recruitment across the board. 
Um, we, our um, first grant had a lot of moving parts to it. We were able to put two masters prepared nurses back in the hospital setting. Uh, so they have actually completed their masters and are in the hospital. So that improves patient outcomes by having you know, that higher educated person in the facility. So we partnered with a healthcare organization. Then I also want to second what you were saying about um, having the parents on board and grandparents. Um, you know, I came from poverty. I always thought education was the way out. So I have two sons, both college educated, and all my grandchildren are college educated. I have one that's 16, I'm well, almost 17. And so since I started with this program and recognizing the opportunities were, that were out there, I've been very open to discussions with her. In fact, she came to me because I was more open-minded about it, thinking I would be the most close-minded. And um, so I think it opened my eyes to there are other opportunities out there. It's not an either or. But here's the thing, she's a 4.0 student. She will qualify. She's doing dual enrollment and you know all of these programs. And what if she wants to join the military? Need to know more about that. Is it better to go to college and be in the military? I don't know. Because my pathway was straight into college, you know, spend those four years locked down somewhere on the program. And uh, she likes mechanical engineering. Last year we went to see the mechatronics program. Mm -hmm. Opened my mind completely. This semester, or next semester, next year, she's taking a welding class. And it's just, you know, she's been in robotics for four years. So, um, but very eye-opening listening to everyone. And I do think that the message when we're talking about these things, the support is going to come through the grandparents, the moms, uh, you know, what can we do to support these kids, essentially, you know, getting on a good pathway. And you know, these jobs at 1250, whatever, they really are uh, life changing when you can put in the overtime hours. Um, you know, the reentry program, I love that. I hope your governor's on board. I don't know, you know, do you work with parole boards? I've worked with reentry. I know what that takes. So um, anyway, I thoroughly enjoy being here and it opens my mind because I do have students that I have to say, you know, nursing is not for you at this time. And so I wanna know what other paths are out there. Great, thank you for making some of those connections and hearing lots of Great conversations are going to take place today. I want to give um, Allison and Kevin a chance to respond to everyone. Just what you're what you're hearing, what's exciting to you, and um, what I'm going to do after we break is think about all these ideas that you've put forward um, and and put some ideas on these boards here, these flip charts, some statements about things we could be working together, you could be working on together with your colleagues over the course of the year. And then ask you to uh, use sticky notes before the end of the day, hopefully sometime in the next couple of hours before we all forget and get on to other things, um, to identify where you would be willing to put in some time and collaboration over the course of the year. So we can make some steps towards understanding what might be good topics, and we'll do further feedback on those um, down the road after today. So um, just before we have the kind of reflections, um, any just any one issue that's on your mind that you want to make sure we have on the agenda, and go ahead and just speak it as loud as you can to the audience. Um, referencing your report, I really would like to see more information about um, how to within these grant programs, um, grassroots, um, go, just, just grassroots encouragement from citizens on how to look at their community and be a part of this so that they can help raise the quality of life indices for their community. Because I think that's the key to make sure. And that's also going to help with the marketing and the whole number. That, that give, that, give that ownership back to the people that we're trying to serve. Because they know exactly what they need if we ask. 
I love that, and you're, you said it much better than I will. Grassroots citizen, community participation, to make sure we have good quality of life. Um, other other things that haven't made it um, that folks haven't commented on? Just on her comment, the professional organizations for like social workers, nurses, those are, I mean, I'm using those now, partnered with two nursing professional organizations to work with recruitment, and they want to know more about our programs anyway, so we're partnering together for continuing education hours, but I'm working with two nursing professional organizations. So just trying to generate excitement. Excellent, excellent. Uh, other things you want to make sure are on the table. People have a chance to join you in your interests. Anything that didn't get mentioned? Yes. I would say we're all uh, come from different organizations, serving different people, but I think the commonality is um, we're all serving an underserved population. So there may be people who don't look like you, who have different backgrounds than you. Great, I forgot to uh, put the other idea to the mic. So professional associations, professional organizations, making sure those are activated in our community for information. And just now, um, making sure that we can work with people who are different from us and have the resources and tools to do that. So, okay, great. What else? What else do we miss? Okay, so yeah, thank you. Um, in our program, we have uh, some positive highlights. But I was wondering, how can we keep these people motivated throughout the whole project? Like in Washington State, some of our training programs are 10 weeks to 16 weeks. How do we keep them motivated? Because a lot of our participants get to the end point and kind of fall out of the program or quit the program because of transportation, because of uh, child care, and other things that uh, uh, the PowerPoint uh, provided or the presentation uh, provided to us. So um, how can we keep them motivated? If you think about it, a lot of these people have self-esteem issues, don't have any support from home, uh, sense of alone. So how do we maintain that motivation factor from the recruitment standpoint all the way throughout the whole process? Great, how do we maintain motivation after the end of a program? Making sure people have the continued resources and support to succeed. What do we miss? It doesn't matter. I feel like I'm going to lose control here. But. I'm from a, a community college, and we were just recently awarded a work through um, grant. But I think we need to be careful because the language of higher education, the language of agencies, the language of participants, the language of employment partners is all different. Yes. And so, the language that we use at our colleges, if you've been in higher ed a long time, that's just natural to you. It's so easy to talk about credit hours and this and that and the other. And many of our other partners don't understand that from the participants to um, our agency partners. But our agency's partners speak a language that I don't always understand as well. And so I think that we have to make sure we're paying attention to the work language barrier, not even talking about the actual native language barriers of our participants, but the actual interconnectedness of our partner language. Um, because I think that's, again, we're brand new to this, but worked other grants and other partnerships before, and that's always a humongous hurdle of being able to have kind of a shared terminology um, that is usable by everyone. Thank you, and which matters so much. How many, how many times we say career pathways and mean 10 different things? That's very important. All right, yeah, so just what did, what did you hear? What do you think we're uh, ready to learn about, or what do we need to explore further? I had some other thoughts until she said the language barrier. I think the language barrier is the number one problem because in our dialogues with individuals who, who may be potential participants, sometimes we do, do use the language that discourages them because they don't always tell us that they don't understand. And so one of the things that's important that we have to do is 
we have to become cognizant of our ability to speak on levels that they simply don't understand. And then we have to work to change our language and, for lack of a better word, dilute it to their understanding so that we make them feel comfortable. And I think that will address some of the motivation. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to focus on was, the gentleman said the different grant verticals. I think that's so very important because even as we're listening throughout this room, we're talking about so many different things from high tech to agriculture, to um, K-12 education, to some credentialing through the junior college aspects. Um, Eric is working with individuals who are incarcerated, and even our program focuses on individuals who have suffered from opioid addictions. And so we, we have so many different verticals. I think that that's something very important that we need to talk about because there will be some things that we can learn from one another that will will catapult our own personal progress. Great. Thank you, Allison. I also run a grant that is an out-of-school youth grant, uh, 18 to 24 year olds, and we learned this early on. You've got to you've got to meet that person where they are. You you can't categorize them all, and they're not going to fit in a mold. Uh, you've got to. It's going to take time. So you really have to gain trust, that's big. But you, you can't, uh, it, it just takes time and patience because you, uh, you're you changing and oftentimes a, a full mindset or a culture or a whole generation or generational uh, things that have gone on. So you, you just can't, you uh, just don't, don't be surprised when you're surprised that somebody didn't, you know, follow through or something because it's you're you're just changing the whole mindset and it's it's uh it, it's a it's a process it's a it's a process that is so rewarding uh i know our inmates have been it's been really successful with them that they're in a place that they uh i believe that they they, they know what they'll you know what what's next if they don't if they don't do something um and with all the cognitive training and other things we do with them uh, in the jail before they even start. The, and they're not all qualified to even get through that training. If they don't exhibit certain things of conduct and stuff in, in just in the jail population, they don't participate. So, uh, but when you see them come back and they're employed, they're happy, uh, they want to come in and get that certification that they didn't get when they were incarcerated and we're working with them to get that one. Just, you know, free gratis, we're just going to do it. Uh, they know where they're going to take place, I guess you'd say. So, that's it. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. Um, Alex, do you want me to wrap up in one minute or three minutes? Whatever you need. Okay. <laughs> it's just about 9.30 here. Um, so, Allison, Kevin, thank you so much for kicking off the conversation and helping us with some thoughts on how to move forward. I just have uh, a few more slides that can help me jog my memory of some potential next steps and open to feedback here. Um, but you know, why why convene a learning community? Why have a shared agenda? Make sure there's a venue to discuss these issues. Connect with your peers. Uh, already seeing lots of connections, um, important conversations that I expect will start over the course of the day. Um, make sure that questions are answered so that you have access to experts, you have access to information um, to get questions answered so you can move on to whatever needs to get done in your community or together um, and make sure we're promoting the work that you all are doing. So we're doing some learning, we're communicating some of that as well. Um, this is not, a, not a, an incredibly in, intensive agenda for the year, although I expect that there is a lot of interest um, that we can accommodate that but make sure that people get together in a virtual environment as a, a minimum to discuss some leading practices bring new research to the table um, as it comes up and address some of these challenges and uh, not just in the, the substantive work we're trying to do but the operational and the professional challenges that some of you mentioned um, and make sure there's there's ongoing discussion and communication, so we're not uh, not doing this alone, and we're inviting new ideas. 
So we talked about issues that would be interesting. Um, we'll talk further about you know, speakers and specific for focus areas, programs and regions that represent the diversity of the Delta, and potential options. Um, these were just some ideas we threw out initially. So I didn't, you know, even though I had a sort of a data-driven presentation, we didn't hear a lot about metrics and performance measures. Just throwing that out there, um, effectively reaching businesses, engaging employers. We did hear about childcare today. We did hear about working with veterans. Um, so, so, so we're gonna uh, put some of these uh, ideas on these flip charts here, and then you have all these different colored circles at your table. All the different colors mean the same thing. You're interested. You want to get involved in that issue. Um, I'll let everybody know that when we have some issues on the board, and if we've missed some really big things or you just want to make sure we've recorded it, go ahead and flip that flip chart page and write a new ID on the next page. Make sure that your voice is heard and that people have the opportunity to engage with you on issues that you would put some time and energy into. So with that, I'll wrap up this session. Very excited for this today. Thank you so much for the time for this opportunity to produce the report. I look forward to talking to everyone further. There's not a break yet. If you look at your agenda, but if you do have to use the restroom um, or grab some water or coffee, totally fine with me. Uh, so thank you uh, to Allison's, one Kevin up here. That was an awesome, awesome session. So thank you so much. We're going to jump into the uh, who's who speed dating uh, activity that we like to do at these, but just want to make a couple of comments from some of the observations um, that I made during that session. And I think a lot of what we're talking about really here is the, uh, the full workforce development ecosystem. And that obviously has a lot of uh, people uh, and organizations and uh, programming involved in that. Um, but some of the key words that just uh, stuck out to me, one of them being access um, to these programs. Are we uh, reaching out to the people that we need to? And then also in terms of access, are we affording them the opportunity to actually participate in our workforce training uh, programs. And I know wraparound services was mentioned quite a few times and uh, can truly include so many different things between uh, housing and, and transportation, and childcare, food, food on the table uh, for folks. One of the things that um, I learned when I first joined DRA in uh, January 2016 was the USDA Summer Foods Program. Uh, for, for kids who eat uh, uh, school provided lunches, free school provided lunches during the year. Only one out of five of them during the summer times are, are receiving those um, lunches or those meals um, by USDA that are provided at no cost to them. One in five. And that can mean that four out of those five are going hungry during the summer. So it's just something to, to think about. And then also mental health. Um, and especially over the past two years, I think we've seen um, those challenges skyrocket and then of course substance use disorder. Um, are we offering workforce training programs that are, are paid opportunities uh, for folks who uh, maybe can't hold a job while also going through that training? Are they being trained or paid uh, while working on the job um, and being trained as well, giving them the opportunity to be able to have all of those other things that they need um, to do that. Equity uh, was another word that came to mind. Um, reaching out to women and minorities who might not be participating in um, some of these programs and other marginalized groups are reaching out to them um, to participate in these programs. Collaboration, um, are we, do we actually have everybody at the table? And I think a lot of times we bring the same people to the table every single time. That just creates fatigue, by the way, right? We all know that. And I think knowing all of you in this room, you are normally one of those people at the table, but who else should we be reaching out to and bringing in uh, to leverage their expertise 
um, in, in partnership? And then also, are we making informed decisions um, using the data that we have available uh, to us? Not only are we meeting the needs of employers, but are we meeting the needs of, of workers, job seekers, and um, I'd also say families. And going back to why DRA uh, was created in the first place, one of um, my favorite <coughs> lines in the, um, in the statute um, mentions that DRA is to uh, ensure that the economy of the Delta region reaches economic parity with that of the rest of the United States. Um, and one of the things that we've had past leadership and, and current leadership say is that um, we want DRA to be able to go out of business. And that means that this region no longer needs DRA to assist because we have um, uh, reached that economic parity with the rest of the uh, region. Lastly, changing the narrative. Um, not everyone needs to get a four-year degree, not everyone wants to. Not everybody has the opportunity to do that. Um, and looking at our region, the majority, the vast majority, do not have a four-year degree. So what are we doing to put those people into jobs and to make sure that they can uh, sustain their living? Um, for the who's who, thank you for bearing with me on my soapbox there. Uh, for the who's who, a uh, question for all of you, are you sitting with people you know at your table? Okay, how many of you are sitting with people or, or two or more people that you know at your table? Raise your hand, anybody. Okay, good, you guys are gonna move, okay? Because um, we're gonna make this fun. I want you to go sit with people that you do not know, so we are going to shuffle this room a little bit, okay? But this is what I want us to do. We've got four or five minutes Okay, and this is what I want you to accomplish when you are introducing yourself uh, to folks at your new table. Name, title, organization, that's the easy stuff. What's your project that uh, you have gotten funded? And then your biggest challenge or greatest opportunity that you have experienced so far or that you see coming. Um, what we wanna do is find some commonality. And I think you probably heard some, uh, some commonality around the room. We want to uh, let you hear from more people um, so I do need one person at the table to be my timer. Um, you can set it to either four minutes or five minutes, doesn't matter, but we really need to stay on time. So if we can do a four or five minute little, you know, get to know you, here's my project, biggest challenge, greatest opportunity, you're gonna find that you'll meet a lot of people in this room and I want you to share uh, contact information, do all those things. We'll also provide contact information at the end of this. Are we ready? All right, find a new table if you need to do so, and let's get started. Uh, we have a little less time, about 45 minutes, and let's move.